All right. Uh, welcome, welcome everybody to Apache Cassandra Bay Area Meetup. This is a. Uh, it's been a long time since we had this in-person meetup in the Bay Area, and I'm so glad to host you uh, here at Netflix. Uh, this is an opportunity for all of us in the Cassandra ecosystem to reconnect and discuss all the advancements that are happening in the Apache Cassandra and how Apache Cassandra is solving the cutting edge technologies and addressing Gen AI, vector search capabilities. So it's amazing times to be in the community and I'm glad we have this opportunity to you know, reconnect and discuss all the challenges ahead of us. Um, really quick, few logistical things uh, before we dive into this evening. You all know where the you know kitchen is, so if you need some food and drinks, uh, building the uh, kitchen area, and the restrooms are towards your life, towards your left when you're talking, uh, walking to the kitchen. Um, for about thirty, uh, about ninety minutes, uh, we will have uh, amazing talks lined up uh, from folks from Netflix, Uber, Datastax, and Apple. And after the after the presentations, after these talks, we still have one more hour. And uh, we have dinner, food, and drinks arranged in the same area. So do stay back, connect, uh, you know, use this opportunity to talk to other community members and hear about all the amazing things that you're doing. Um, Netflix also has uh, two innovations uh, put that as a posters on there. So we can use that as an uh, opportunity for you to learn about uh, what kind of distributed data access innovations that this team is doing. So now uh, let's talk, uh, let's get into the interesting part. So we're going to start with uh, um, uh, from folks from Netflix, Vidya and Raj, our amazing, stunning colleagues, talk about how Netflix handles Cassandra tombstones at scale and how SLO-based uh, retrieval work at Netflix. After that, uh, Jadeep from Uber, Chris from Netflix will talk about incremental repair scheduling in Cassandra. So if you are operating Cassandra, this is a talk that you absolutely don't want to miss. And then followed by that, we have Dinesh, Apache, Cassandra, PMC, and Chair. Uh, we'll talk about um, you know how massive deployment deployments like Apple is handling the you know petabytes of data without basically using the passwords and a Cassandra five. So I don't know. I, I'm really looking forward to how he's achieving that innovation. And um, lastly, we'll wrap with uh, our world-renowned speaker, Patrick McFadden, our own. We'll talk about how Gen AI and vector search um, are, you know, are being addressed in Cassandra 5 and how Cassandra 5 can really help you for the next generation Gen AI and uh, RAG and, you know, vector search uh, systems that you're going to build. With that, um, so these are the faces. Uh, if you want to say hi after the, uh, after the meetup, please do network with them. And um, of course, I cannot, <laughs> I cannot end my talk without talking about my sales pitch. Yes, uh, this team is hiring. Uh, we have roles open in, in several job functions, all the way from engineering manager to L4, L5 engineers. If you are interested, we are happy to chat. Uh, you know, talk to any engineer who doesn't have a badge. So those are the Netflix engineers. So learn more about uh, is it just a sales pitch or is it really cutting edge technologies that we are um, solving? So my engineers are the best to talk about it. And if you talk to me, it's just, it's just a sales pitch. But without further ado, Vidya and Raj, take it away. Thank you. Thanks, Vinay. That was a great introduction. Uh, hi, I'm Vidya, Vidya Arvind. Hi, I'm Raj. Uh, today, we are going to talk about um, how Netflix optimizes uh, use of Cassandra at massive scale. When we say massive scale, um, we want, want to talk about one quote that comes to mind. We can solve any problem by introducing an extra level of interaction. It's a very famous uh, David Vila quote, um, and we want to start with that. We did introduce a level of interaction through abstraction, and um, before accessing the data stores, you're hitting an abstraction, and abstraction is passing um, uh, or uh, connecting to your data stores. And um, we started abstraction in early 2020, 
uh, we started with a few production use cases. Um, you can think of shards as apps that are connecting to databases. And with V1 API, very simple APIs, puts and um, puts, deletes, and gets. And uh, in 2009, we uh, productionalized the first use case. Um, that year, we onboarded 20 of them. In 2021, we had um, uh, we grew to double, right? When we grew to double, uh, 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 engineer of three couldn't handle how many um, provisioning requests we had to do. So uh, we built automation of shards and namespaces and rewrote our control plane already. Within a year, we had to rewrite our control plane. Um, in 2022, um, Already we were growing, uh, we wanted much more robust APIs. We were doing V2 API, um, high level client, which uh, could signal back and forth the uh, intent. And uh, we did chunking and uh, scans. You can see the posters there and talk to our engineers about these posters. And in 2023, uh, we did our biggest thrift migration. We moved from Cassandra to O to three and now in four. Uh, but um, we moved a lot of use cases, uh, around 250 apps. Uh, but uh, the number of shards we created is 98. In 2024, we are um, innovating, uh, innovating through business initiatives and uh, uh, adding new features like leasing and um, other other features. Uh, totally, we have 391 shards and uh, around 3,500 plus um, use cases. Every use case is different, and we will hear uh, hear about that. Um, we uh, with, with abstractions, uh, direct access is gone. Um, uh, most of the direct access doesn't happen now. We uh, everything goes through um, abstractions, and um, eighty three percent of them we have covered through abstractions right now, and uh, only sixteen percent is left. And we are planning to cover that. Our largest use case is eight million uh, QPS is what we are dealing with in abstractions. Um, in among them. Uh, uh, our biggest Cassandra cluster is operating at 1.8 million RPS and 4.9 million WPS. That's our biggest. Um, key value uh, is one of the abstractions what, that we have. And in key value abstractions, we uh, do use cases like graph, trees, queues, entity service. Uh, we uh, have features like chunking, near cache scans, deduping caching. Uh, we cater to needs of feature stores, events, frequency capping, you recommendations, rating, you name few protos choice JSON and some of the formats we deal with. Uh, why abstractions? Um, when you think about abstractions, you want a uniform interface. You want best practices to be applied. You want common patterns to be taken and uh, uh, done in abstractions. Um, we want to users to focus on their business problems, not, um, uh, not worry about what database we are using uh, underneath, right? Um, uh, we can decouple databases uh, through abstractions and uh, do streamless, um, seamless transition from one database to another, or go or do migrations through abstractions. Um, I want to talk uh, high level about what key value abstraction is. Key value abstraction, you can think about it as a hash map of um, uh, ID and a sorted map of um, bytes with which is one is a key and one is a value. We also store a little bit of meta metadata about the value, like uh, what is a chunk? It, it does a chunk, uh, if it chunks, uh, does it compress? Things like that, a life cycle of data as well. Some of the uh, key APIs we support are put skets, um, uh, delete item scan, and mutate items. Can abstraction transform chaos into clarity? That's uh, gist of the question, and uh, that's where we wanted to go with this presentation. Um, one of the chaos uh, that we see in Cassandra often is tombstones, and we wanted to uh, tackle that today in the presentation. Um, Tombstones are special markers, uh, as you all know. Um, uh, when you delete the data, they, you create a tombstone in the uh, system. And uh, whenever uh, GC grace uh, period is uh, um, done, uh, you kind of go delete the tombstones. Uh, specifically, when you look at the data, 
uh, here I'm representing account uh, data, uh, accounts and profiles, and profile information is what is represented here. When you delete uh, through a partition, you are uh, really deleting or adding just one tombstone. When you delete a, a range of keys, um, you, you still it's one tombstone marker. But when you want to delete a list of items, you are really creating a bunch of uh, tombstones per key. Um, your when you go um, to get the data for partition level data, which is account for account one, match all the information that is there. You're reading through the tombstones. You're filtering all the uh, data out, and you only uh, returning back the live data. But uh, when you're doing a range, similar thing happens. You go to the key, and um, after the key, you read the whole range. And when uh, you finish reading, you filter the tombstones out, and um, uh, any data that is uh, dele deleted data, you filter it out and return the value. Uh, key uh, key match keys are uh, much more easier. Uh, you don't you're not reading a lot of tombstones. You're only uh, targeting those keys and um, related tombstones. Um, I wanted to point out one more API, which is the scan API. Uh, in uh, most of the cases, or a lot of cases, we want to read the whole table. When you want to read the whole table, you go to the whole ring and start reading the token ranges uh, for that particular table. And you want to scan the whole table. And um, you can think of each token range as a queue. And you're uh, going through the queue and reading the whole data. If you uh, display it linearly, you will uh, see it here. You can uh, see the posters about uh, scan in um, in our display. You can talk to the engineer about it. Um, scan, uh, when you say match all, you're going through the whole table, reading the whole table, including uh, tombstones, and you're trying to eliminate um, all the data and only read the live data, right? What happens when you're reading this much of tombstones, and when, especially when, when you have a lot of tombstones, you have increased latency, query timeouts, increased CPU utilization, um, high disk I.O., uh, repair performances are um, uh, high. Uh, it affects your repair performance, and um, you really, what you see is like sometimes um, a tombstone overwhelming issue. You're uh, you're re you're only returning 70 rows back to the user, but you read um, 16k plus tombstones, and it increases your uh, CPU. Your CPU looks everywhere uh, like in a hundred percent mark, and you're under provisioned. We can do some operational stuff like um, force compaction. You can delete the partition th and then compact. Uh, you can do a bunch of uh, these operational stuff, and, uh, and immediately you see your uh, system coming to a normal state. That being said, how can we optimize this via abstraction is the question. All of these problems exist in Cassandra. How are de we dealing with, with uh, key value abstraction. Raj is going to continue talking about. Thanks, Vidya. So I'll walk you through some scenarios that will show how uh, certain queries of ours get impacted with tombstones. And then uh, what are the solutions we have implemented to uh, mitigate these problems, right? So uh, let's start with uh, how a get items query with a match all predicate works in absence of tombstones. So the client also provides a page to a page size, which basically is how many bytes they want to restrict uh, per page of data that they are retrieving. So when the key value service gets this request, it uh, makes a query to Cassandra with a limit by number of rows, and it tries to fill a page. And if the page can have more bytes fit into it, it will uh, make additional queries to Cassandra and tries to fill up the page. And once the page is full, it will respond back with a uh, retrieved items and a page token and all this while uh, within staying within the SLO. Now let's imagine what would happen the same case when tombstones are present, right? So there could be some additional latency in retrieving the uh, data from Cassandra and overall the accumulated accumulated latency can exceed the SLO that is promised and ultimately the client could time out. So if you have to see that scenario, the initial query from uh, Cassandra could return some data but that a uh, query due to processing the tombstones could be a little latent. And to fill up the page, KV will make additional queries. And those could, queries could also be latent. And ultimately, this accumulated latency could uh, be larger than the SLO promised. And uh, the client would timeout. So we potentially have uh, 
failed the query, right? Like the client did not make any progress. And to mitigate this, we have introduced something called as limit by SLO. So the key value, instead of uh, waiting for the page to be completely filled, it will detect that, okay, can I, I can do I have some data to re return? And if it sees that, okay, it's going to exceed the SLO by 80%, um, then it will return early with a page token. This ensures that the client is still able to make gradual progress on the query without completely failing the uh, request. So if you look at the previous scenario where Cassandra was retrieving some uh, data and it was latent, in this case, key value will observe that, okay, the accumulated latency is almost greater than 80% of the SLO and it will just return the data with whatever retrieved results it has with a page token. And this uh, does not solve all the tombstone related issues especially let's see if there are a large number of tombstones, the initial query itself to Cassandra could be very latent and the KV will not have any data to respond back. So it cannot re just re return an empty results with the page token because the subsequent query also will not be, will be starting from scratch and it will not make any progress. So it will be deadlocked. So to work around this uh, issue, we have introduced something called as, okay, uh, once again, tombstone spreading. So what does tombstone spreading do here? Instead of issuing, uh, when KV uh, gets a delete request, instead of doing a delete to the Cassandra, it writes an item with a TTL and marks that uh, item as expired. The TTL is chosen from a range randomly. And this is to ensure that when these items actually get deleted on Cassandra, there is no clustering of tombstones. And uh, when KV retrieves these items from Cassandra, it does filtering. So you could imagine this as a KV layer of tombstones, additional uh, tombstones that KV is managing. Uh, I'll highlight like what is the specific uh, difference between the uh, KV layer tombstones and Cassandra layer tombstones. So in this scenario, if we take a look, uh, there are tombstones, uh, instead of the Cassandra tombstones, we have items that are marked with uh, uh, TTL and marked as expired. So when KV retrieves these items from Cassandra, uh, instead of Cassandra timing out, it will just uh, return these items back to KV and KV would be filtering out these items. And now KV can respond back with even an empty results with a page token because the subsequent query, when it comes to key value service, it's able to paginate uh, by resuming from where it has stopped before. So the main difference between the KV layer tombstones and the Cassandra layer tombstone is that the KV layer tombstone is able to be uh, like we can paginate over the KV level tombstones, whereas on the Cassandra layer, you would pretty much get a uh, exception saying you have scanned X number of tombstones and the query is about it. So that's the key difference between the tombstones that we manage. Uh, and uh, uh, eventually the goal is that the query is able to make a gradual progress without uh, uh, actually failing. So this solution ensures that we are making gradual progress but it does come with trade-offs such as there is an increased end-to-end -end latency that uh, needs to process the overall query and also there is an increased amount of storage utilization because the retention is higher than uh, what is expected but uh, uh, the system overall operates at a degraded performance but still is not failing completely which is acceptable in most of our use cases and even then, this does require some kind of a balancing, like what would the right TTL be? What is the range of TTL that you should be choosing? And this depends on the compaction interval, the repairs, and then the GC gray seconds. And then uh, some of the enhancements uh, in Cassandra that would enable KV to offload this operations to Cassandra would be uh, Cassandra supporting limit by SLO, like uh, then we, might be able to retrieve the data from Cassandra itself within the SLO, then limit by bytes. So we have seen uh, KV making multiple round trips to Cassandra to fill up a page, but instead if limit by bytes existed, we could potentially avoid those multiple round trips. And then the other one was the uh, pagination of tombstones. So basically, uh, even when there are a large number of tombstones being scanned on the Cassandra side, instead of filling the query, if we get the response back and then ability to paginate for the subsequent queries uh, exactly from where we have stopped, not redoing the work. That would also enable uh, us to make progress. And then incremental repairs, which uh, actually enable us to purge tombstones in 30 minutes. So that would be great. And with that, uh, I'd like to thank everyone and hand over it to Chris, who is going to talk about incremental repairs.